Hello YouTube, this is Bowtide Media, and welcome to the final installment of 2020 in Review with Bowtide Media, where I go over my best of 2020 music projects, and where else would it end on the top 20 albums of the year. I'm going to go over exactly 20 to 1, but if you guys want to see my entire list, I will leave it in the link below and in the comment section so you can see exactly what my whole list for the year was. But let's get into this video. At number 20 is Steven's Acrasia, and while this thing is full of kind of classic indie tronica tropes, it is chock full of emotion and kind of raw energy that kind of comes from all the tracks in this project. They deal with a lot of things as identity and not feeling like yourself and addiction and lust. It's a crazy project chock full of anything you can possibly imagine. As you explore this project and go track by track, there's so much more emotional depth that kind of just adds on to itself. And this one, while not as good as his first LP, I think is really strong. Number 19 is Church by Galantis. And I might get a lot of flack for this. And I know I'm definitely not in the majority of people that enjoy Galantis's music, but I am a huge EDM fan and I kind of grew up with Galantis. I kind of watched them kind of rise to stardom with their first LP and then just find so much more success after that. And so I've always been pretty partial to them and just enjoying what they put out. I don't listen to anything too seriously of theirs. I, in terms of, I'm not like really looking for emotional depth in anything. I'm looking for pretty much just fun, happy club bangers or stuff that's nice at parties. And uh, I just like it because they're bright, light and fun. There's also a ton of star power on this project. And while it's not always for the best, it adds so much more to each track. Number 18 is Puppet. I know you know who I am. Over a long period of time, Puppet has really been kind of honing in his exact skills and where his niche lies within the kind of blend of rock and electronic music. It's kind of been a fusion of both. An electro rock style is the best way I would put his music, but he definitely found exactly what he's looking for on this LP and he knows it too. He was super excited for the release of this project and the fact that he actually came out with a full album means that he's ready and he knows this is what he wants to do. At number 17 is Mac Miller's Circles. And I sadly say that I did not know about him before his death, but listening to the project after his death, this is a fantastic posthumous project. This whole album really feels like a journey through his life and his struggles with addiction, fame, and all that comes with it. There really is a lot of pain and suffering and hurt that went into making each of these tracks, and you can definitely feel it when you listen through. It's only an hour long, but really feels like an autobiography into his life. Number 16 is Taylor Swift's Folklore. And I am not a huge Taylor Swift fan by a long shot, but we kind of saw that this kind of indie folk style of Taylor Swift would come out eventually. She would go, I wouldn't say back to, but the kind of singer songwriter classic album that's more acoustic and definitely more lyrically driven than anything else she's done before. It really seems like this pandemic has done well for Taylor Swift and her ability to put content out and write the stuff that she really wants to write. Number 15 is The Promised Land by Muzz. I would always say that he has been the kind of king of drum and bass music for a long time, and this album solidified that statement fully. Every track on this project is explosive and full of energy and so much driven pace to it, it is hard to ignore it. You've got the loud early 2010s vibe in Start Again and your really nice cinematic, almost ocean feel in Somewhere Else. And you have to credit the features on this project that come in and really ramp this thing up to 11. At number 14 is Jonathan Ogden's 24. And I would be shocked if anyone listening right now knew what this project was before I mentioned it now. This is an exploration of kind of musical creativity and sound and a challenge that Jonathan Ogden put on himself. He, from what I understand from this project, sat in his studio or at home creating music wherever he does for 24 hours and created a song for each hour of the day. So I believe he got up at 6 a.m. and wrote 6 a.m. and then wrote a song and then 7 a.m. and wrote a song about that and went through each of the hours of the day and wrote a song for how he felt and what it felt like in the moment. It's not actually a very long project with each track, all 24 of them being about a minute, 30 seconds, but it really is a great exploration into the sound of life. You don't really think of every kind of moment of your day having a specific sound or tone to it. But when you listen to this project, it's like, holy crap, I feel like I can experience a whole day of just living and being in this album. And big shout out to 2200, which is the 10 p.m. song, Where Can I Go? That one is so good. At number 13 is the collaboration between Tom Misk and Yusuf Days. What kind of music? 
This project is a vibe and a half. It is so good to either drive to or just put on the background while you're doing work of some kind. It is so fantastic to listen to in that capacity. The whole project is a medley of jazz, neo-soul, funk, and oh, it just hits in all the right places with some absolutely killer bass lines from Yusuf Days. And I mean, you just gotta listen to this thing and vibe out to it. At number 12 is Louis the Child's Here For Now. For the titans that have been Louis the Child, they have been around the EDM or electronic music scene for a long time now, but have never put out an actual full length LP. And here they are with their debut, and it is pretty solid. It's a little bit more of a modern take on the dance, pop, electro pop culture, and the last couple songs end with some really fun, light-hearted future bass tracks, which uh, are actually some of my favorites on the whole thing. At number 11 is Dua Lipa's Future Nostalgia. And I am so impressed that someone managed to create an album that was called Future Nostalgia and both sounded futuristic and nostalgic. It is crazy from just the album arts and the single arts to the way it sounded sonically and was lyrically portrayed. I, I'm blown away with the ability to actually execute something like this. It really felt like a breath of fresh air to have this nice radio pop friendly music that was really, really good and something that I really enjoyed listening to. I never put on the radio now because I think radio music honestly sucks right now. And the whole, yeah, it's just not very good. But this, this is something I've listened to for a long time. Entering into the top 10, we're gonna hit number 10 with Justin O's Welcome to the City of Oz. While Justin O doesn't rely a ton on lyricism in this project, a lot of it's just production and storyline through that, there is a immensely cool narrative that is running throughout this whole project, which kind of gives off a 1984-esque vibe where it's these machines rising up against the humans and the humans kind of taking their power back. And it is so cool to listen to. And visually with all the music videos, it is a great pairing. Justin O somehow manages to create some heavy dubstep and mid-tempo bangers and do some electronic light future based stuff and make both of them sound narratively coherent and just have crazy good quality on all sides of the genre spectrum. Number nine is The Weekends After Hours. Abel will forever be one of the best vocal performers in the music industry. His darker party centric tonality is so good when paired with his vocal performances. I particularly love the synthwave neo funk kind of inspirations that are littered all throughout this project, especially in stuff like Blinding Lights and After Hours. It seemed like the weekend was going to be stuck in party anthems for a long time, but nope. After Hours comes and really shows what the after hours of his music looks like. It's atmospherically dark, gritty, and so fun to listen to. Number eight is Desire by Bob Moses. Considering the short time frame that this project actually inhabits, only being seven songs long, Bob Moses really packs in a ton of dense musical elements into this project. It's almost like they crafted this experience, this musical experience. I know all albums are like that, but this one really feels like something different where you just kind of need to put headphones on, black out everything, close your eyes and just experience. Number seven is Phoebe Bridger's Punisher. And I am not particularly one for singer songwriter type projects, but I heard a lot of buzz about this one album in particular, this Phoebe Bridger's. And I was like, you know what? I'll check it out. And I was blown away. The stuff was so good. I particularly love cinematic-y kind of feels to songs, especially ones that have a kind of quiet start and then build into something that's really grand and just a musical explosion. And uh, I Know The End is definitely that. And also a big shout out to Savior Complex. But seriously, I Know The End could be the song of 2020 and all that encompassed all that was happening in the world it is perfectly portrayed in one single song. At number six is Butterfly Effect by Coven. This is their sophomore project and is 14 tracks long and packs a punch from front to end. You've got a range of drum step, drum and bass, dubstep, electronica, anything kind of in that range is on this project. This album really knows when to go hard and when to pull it back and when to do a little bit of both. And also big shout out to Katie's vocals here. She just absolutely kills it. And I think she actually has one of the best vocal performances or voice in electronic music right now. Number five is No Future by Eden. And I would probably be a little partial to this project and Eden in particular. I would say he's tied for my favorite artist of all time, him and Daft Punk. There's just something about his Indietronica style that's just so invigorating and fun and unique and cool to listen to. 
It feels like every track is a new experience, whether it's the weird MacBook sounds on streams or the crushing three minute guitar solo on Rushing. There is a ton of variety on this project and Eden definitely hits all the right notes for me personally and what I love and want to listen to musically. Part of his flair is the almost mumbled low monotone vocal performance that when paired with actually his own real grand singing when he goes high and hits those notes is a great dichotomy and I actually like his vocal performance that way. Number four is Joji's Nectar. Up to today, this project is easily the one that I've spent the most amount of time contemplating and figuring out what I was going to rate it and where I was going to put it. I've been a Joji fan for quite some time now, and this thing is a whole new level for him. The Space Trilogy of Sanctuary, Run, and Gimme Love are some of the best things he's ever put out. Easily the top three tracks I think he's ever produced. Joji does a really good job of covering all the ground with that kind of space opera that I was talking about, the high energy stuff like 777 and Nitrous, and the really, really low stuff like Your Man and Like You Do. Number three is the groovy funk project that is Tame Impala's The Slow Rush. There's something about Tame Impala's vocal performances that are just special and really unique. You often have no idea what he's saying, but it's got this ethereal, almost heavenly tonality to them that you just can't ignore. I'm quite a big fan of longer tracks, and Tame Impala is definitely known for padding the runtime on his individual songs. Tame Impala has this kind of vintage production style to each of them that make you feel like you're going back in time, and it just works really well for each track individually. Each individual track tells its own little story, and as an entire unit, it works really well cohesively. Number two is The Making of a Paracosm by Casbo. The title is exactly as the album portrays it, the making of a paracosm. A paracosm means an imaginary world. So the whole runtime of this LP really is a journey through the making of an imaginary world and all of the sonical and lyrical elements that comes with it. Caswell manages to kind of capture the essence of nature and this mystical sound to it that wraps itself around really well in the idea of making a paracosm. It is an absolutely beautiful LP to listen to front to back. And before we get into number one, real quickly, if you want to see my full list of everything I've ranked and listened to and rated this year, it'll be in both the description and the comment section below. But without any further ado, number one, Bowtie Media's best album of 2020, RTJ4 by Run The Jewels. This album absolutely goes off in every capacity. Lyrically, production quality, social and political commentary, it absolutely hits all the right notes. It is impressive that they managed to do all of this in 2020. Killer Mike and LP have created a project for the history books. If there was any album, EP, or just project in general that I would define 2020 as, it would be this one, RTJ4. Their ability to just go ham in every capacity is unrivaled, especially for anything in 2020. The ability for Killer Mike to write a verse back in late 2019 that says, I can't breathe, and that to become the moniker or a main moniker for the BLM movement in 2020 is foresight that shouldn't be humanly possible. It really just goes to show how deep rooted and systemic these issues have been and Run the Jewels tackles it head on in both a fun hype, just go at your face, but nothing for me is as good as Holy Kalama Fuck, the track that absolutely destroys you. It is so fun and just loud and in your face and hits all the right notes for me. But that is it. That is my list for 2020, Bowtie Media's top 20 albums of 2020. If you guys want to see the rest of the list, obviously it's in the description and link below. You can see everything that I've rated. And if you have any questions about what I specifically gave anything, it'll be in that link in the description below for the whole actual list on albumoftheyear.org. But I've been Bowtie Media. I will see you guys in another video.